People often ask me a lot about how I prepare for concerts and even say, what does an orchestra conductor actually do? Well, most of my time is spent planning and learning music. To find great music to play, I listen to a lot of music at home and in my car. And then as concerts and rehearsals approach, I spend time with scores, maybe go on a walk and then grab a cup of coffee. I'm Bruce Kiesling, music director of the Adrian Symphony Orchestra here at the Buzz Cafe and Marketplace and uh, getting ready for our rehearsals for this week's concert, but also taking a little moment to tell you a little bit of the inside story behind the music that we'll be playing on our concert this week. Now, all of the concerts on this season's program include at least one piece by a female composer. Last month, you might remember, we did Florence Price. This month, we're doing a fantastic piece by Jesse Montgomery. Jesse Montgomery is a, an African-American violinist and composer. She went to Juilliard, so an excellent sort of world-class violinist. And this piece is called Starburst. And she was born in 1981, so she's quite a young composer. And her father actually ran a studio, a recording studio in New York City. And so as she was growing up, she was hearing all of these different fantastic musicians coming in in a huge variety of musical styles. And that influences her work as a composer. So she tends to write things for strings. The piece that we're doing has a few extra winds, some flutes and clarinets, harp and piano added to a big string orchestra. So it, it has a unique sound, but all of the influences that she has, these different kind of world music, jazz, popular music, classical, it all kind of comes together in her work. As I said, this piece is called Starburst, and it was written for a group that she was composer in residence for called the Sphinx Virtuosi. Now, the Sphinx organization, if you're unaware of them, they are based in Detroit, and they do a lot of advocacy for uh, musicians of color, especially string players of uh, African-American string players, uh, Latin American string players, Players and big advocates for them. They have scholarships and a, uh, a concerto competition. And my favorite part of the story is how Jesse talks about that the idea of starburst and this kind of like a, a nebula of stars that are kind of just willed into existence all at once, these different stars that just appear. And she felt that that was the identity of this chamber orchestra. It was full of these wonderful players and they just seemed to uh, appear the stars of this group and so it's a short work it's only about four minutes long and you know I was talking to somebody about the piece the other day and there really isn't a melody in this piece but there's it's very idiomatic so you hear the same things happening again and again and it has an element we call perpetual motion which means the, the music just kind of keeps running it never takes a breath and the ideas are passed around the orchestra so it has things that you'll recognize that come back a little passage work but not a traditional long lyric melody I like to say that it's like a supernova that's just exploding on the scene a short little concert opener and a wonderful way to begin our program the next piece on our program is by Mendelssohn and let's cut to the chase I love the music of Mendelssohn, and I think it is a travesty how all of the child prodigy love in the classical music world goes to Mozart. Oh, a little baby Mozart when he wrote a Twinkle Twinkle Little Star at Five. All that's true. But Mendelssohn is just as exciting, just as brilliant, and produced unbelievable masterworks, his brilliant octet, and the overture to Midsummer Night's Dream before he was like 18 years old. And they had other things in common as well. They both uh, had sisters who were enormously talented musicians and composers in their own right. And tragically, they both died before the age of 40. There's one big difference though between Mozart and Mendelssohn, and that's in how they were raised. And I always say that it's a lesson in child rearing, Mozart, of course, was exploited by his father in particular. At the age of 5 to 10 to 12 years old, he was paraded all over Europe where he was uh, played for royalty and other members of the aristocracy and really taken advantage of in that sense. Because of that, he had a really hard time transitioning to be taken seriously as an adult artist. Mendelssohn, on the other hand, was really protected by his parents. He was not even allowed to give a public concert until he was 19 but he was given every advantage before that. Once a month, his father, who was very wealthy, his family was a mem uh, number of bankers, and his father would hire a 
professional orchestra to come in and play Mendelssohn's works for them so he could hear it played by musicians, but only the family was allowed to hear those concerts. And Mendelssohn, to contrast Mozart, when Mendelssohn became an adult, he seemed to be a very happy and well-adjusted person. Again, tragically, both men died before 40, but uh, very, very different professional lives as adults. And again, I think that's a lesson in child rearing. In this piece, it starts unusually because normally a concerto would start with the entire orchestra playing all the main material, and then we'd hear the main material from the soloist. Even though this piece is in G minor, sometimes we think, oh, minor pieces are going to be heavy or serious. Uh, there is a, a certain uh, profoundness to it, but it's exciting, it's fast, it's great material that descends down the piano. The other thing that's unusual about this piece is that it's through composed. And all that I mean by that is it's not three separate movements. You know, normally we say a concerto should have a fast movement, a slow movement, and then a really fast movement. He has those, but they're connected through musical material that he uses to bridge the connection between those two moments. And then as we transition again to our finale, the brass comes in again. You think it's going to be in minor, but then there's this wonderful moment where it transitions to G major and the sun has arrived and this is a barn burner of a finale, so exciting for the pianist to play. And I always say about this piece, it is just like having a delicious piece of candy. It is sweet, it melts in your mouth, it's made with cane sugar. This is the good stuff, none of that high fructose corn syrup. This is the real thing. It goes by very, very quickly, delightfully short piece, and something that you're gonna absolutely love here. Now for our second half, we've all taken our interval. We come back and our second half of our program includes wonderful music of Respighi. Now, groupies of the Adrian Symphony, you're gonna remember that we did Fountains of Rome. We did Pines of Rome. Well, this is the third and final in a, the set of pieces that we tend to call the Roman triptych by Respighi. When we talk about great orchestrators, we tend to think of two names in particular, Rimsky-Korsakov, he wrote Scheherazade, and Capriccio Espanol, among other wonderful, wonderful Russian works. We think of Ravel, the great French composer who wrote Daphne and Chloe, and the great G major concerto that we did here a couple years ago. And the third name that often comes up as the greatest orchestrators in history, Alterina Respighi. And here, these are absolutely orchestral showpieces. He gives everybody in the orchestra something to do and includes in this piece in particular, everything but the kitchen sink. And for this, he celebrates four different festivals in the Roman calendar, not just one calendar year. He actually jumps all over uh, centuries ago. So the first one, Circus Games, takes us back to the era of the Colosseum, and we have the Christian martyrs and the wild beasts chasing them. And you can imagine just the pageantry of the time because there are antiphonal brass. So the brass is placed in different spots in the hall and we hear them calling back and forth to each other and you just feel like you're in the stadium. You can only imagine just the, the huge trumpets calling back and forth from one side of the stadium to the other. So thrilling and so exciting. What a way to open. And then the orchestra is kind of split into families where our Christian martyrs, they're praying and beautifully represented by a chant theme in the winds. And then our ferocious beast in the lower brass, as you can imagine, chasing them. So we have these two different things going on at the same time. Very short opening movement, very colorful and very exciting. The second movement is the Jubilee, or the Christian Jubilee, which takes place on the papal calendar. And this is a special festival. It only takes place every 50 years. There's a moment where you come over the hill of Mount Mario, and that's when you catch your first glimpse of the city of Rome. And he writes this as this beautiful, quiet moment. And then you start to hear the different church bells throughout the city all ringing. And he orchestrates this brilliantly, so exciting. The arrival after you've traveled days and days, this is your first glimpse of the city, beautifully said. Now the third movement is the celebration of autumn, the hunt, and the harvest. So you can imagine our French horns, they are quite busy in this as we celebrate the hunt and uh, the harvest there. And my favorite part of the work, actually, is the quietest part of this. There is a beautiful and romantic nocturne that evokes this idea of a quiet cafe at night, and it's romantic 
And the instrument that he chooses, very unusual for the orchestra, is a mandolin. So you'll hear the mandolin play tremolo, sort of almost uh, like a folk song. And it is elegant and sweet and even sexy. And I always think when I hear this, it's so beautiful and quiet that clearly when you're hunting, it's not just wild beasts that are out there hunting. Clearly someone is on the hunt for love here. And it is a stunning moment beautifully orchestrated, quiet, and just a brilliant way to set up the finale, which is just a massive, massive party. The finale takes place at the Piazza Navona, one of the major community spaces in Rome. And you just imagine this grand county fair, but everyone from the empire is there. So it's like a bazaar. So you have people from the Far East, people from the West, all coming together with their different cultures, their different tapestries, their different clothing, their different food and different smells. And I always imagine you're like, if you look over here, you're seeing these people dancing in this way and you're hearing the smells of their food. And then you spin around and over here, something completely different. And Respighi captures this in the music so brilliantly. It's so exciting. And there's even these moments where you seem to be spinning around as you look from different place to different place, hearing these different types of music. And there's even some barrel music, some folk songs that you hear going on, as well as a drunk trombonist seems to stumble by, confused, but continuing to play. I don't know what it is about the trombonist. We always pick on him or her as being the drunk one, but you, you cannot miss that in this piece. So I mentioned this is for a very large orchestra. And actually, after this, Respighi never wrote another large scale piece like this. He even wrote to a friend of his. He said, you know what? If you can do it with the modern symphony orchestra, I have done it. And with that, he kind of put down his pen on these kind of large, big, colossal, romantic works. He wrote a few more things over the next eight years before he passed away, but they were much smaller, sort of backward looking, more intimate things. This was the end of the massive orchestral work that he did. And if you remember our concert last month, that actually was probably the longest concert of our year. This concert coming up this week will probably be the shortest. Three delightful pieces, but relatively quick and something you will not want to miss. The concert is Sunday afternoon, November 14th at 3 p.m. at Dawson Auditorium. And hopefully from what you've just heard, concerts that you don't want to miss. Please make plans to join us.